I want you to hit me as hard as you can. This national treasure has transformed how the world looks at the art of acting, becoming what some would call the California Klaus Kinski. He's part movie star, part wild man, and possibly part vampire. Nicolas Cage simply cannot be caged. He brings a heightened reality theatrical style into the modern world of cinema with a dash of extreme kabuki method acting that verges on the realm of spiritual. Nicolas Cage truly is a force that seems to be misplaced in time. Which is why many people believe he's an immortal vampire. Let's take a look at that picture again. See it? He's one of a kind, never conforming, always taking risks with his characters and with his money. Now, I myself am a huge Nicolas Cage fan, and he has many more fans that like him way more than me. They love him so much that sometimes these fans cross the line into stalker. Like when Nicolas Cage became the victim of a home invasion, awaking to find a naked man standing there licking a chocolate fudge sickle. But Nicolas Cage remained calm and talked to the guy out of the house simply using the power of his acting. I said, put the bunny back in the box. This man has one of the craziest careers of any actor I can think of, of any artist I can think of. He dominated the 90s with romantic comedies and blockbuster action films, then seemed to drop off making bomb after bomb after bomb, while still surprising us with a random masterpiece every few years, but then bomb after bomb after bomb after bomb again. For some stars, these kind of bombs can spell the end of your career, yet for Nicolas Cage, the dwindling box office gave rise to one of the most infamous direct-to-video careers we have ever seen. He's one of those actors that even ventured into the land of Japan and did the commercial thing. But what the f happened to him? And when I say what the f I mean that in every sense of the phrase. Like the stupid TMZ type way, but also in a good way, if that makes sense. Like what the f happened to Nicolas Cage? Or like what the f happened to Nicolas Cage? Or like hey what the f happened to Nicolas Cage? Or whoa what the f happened on Nicolas Cage? You know, it's just like on every single level of WTF, I mean it. But yeah, what the f happened to Nicolas Cage? <laughs> but to truly understand what the f happened to Nicolas Cage, we must start at the beginning. And the beginning began when he was born on his birthday, 1964, somewhere in California. But Nicolas Cage was not born a cage. No, 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 in fact, he hails from the closest thing to royalty we have in Hollywood. The Coppola family. You know, those people that make good movies and good wine. But to avoid any appearance of nepotism, Nicholas Coppola changed his name to Cage. He was inspired by the Marvel comic book character Luke Cage. Because Nicholas is a nerd. So, uh, how did you get here? Well, it's kind of a long story. Maybe not that long. Chapter 1. The Rise of Cage His first role came in the 1980s classic Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Blink and you will miss him, and he was billed as Nicholas Coppola, but this is the only film where he is credited under that name. Then came Valley Girl in 1983, the first film he was credited as Nicholas Cage. The film did very well with critics, they loved the performances of the leads, and they found the film to be better than the typical superficial teen comedy of the 80s. I think they tried to remake it and they, they probably shouldn't have. The film made over 17 million dollars on a budget that was less than 1 million. And Nick is such a dedicated actor that he actually fell in love with his co-star. As much as Nicolas Cage wanted to make his own path in Holly Weird, a little nepotism can't hurt. And Cage would take on roles in three of his uncle's movies. The beautiful, amazing, black and white, Rumblefish, Cotton Club, and the most successful of the three, Peggy Sue, got married. Cage also appeared in Alan Parker's Birdie, going full method having two teeth removed without any anesthetic, so he could feel and appreciate the pain. And he was in something called The Boy in Blue, about a Canadian rowing champ where he looked buff as hell. You can see some of those con air muscles poking through.
Page spent several years building a solid resume, but raising Arizona is what many would consider his true breakout, which he had to audition for about 20 times. Because he excited and confused the Coen brothers, Nicolas Cage would make the Coen brothers laugh every time, but they didn't know why they were laughing, which is a perfect way to explain the enigma of Cage. You love him, but you don't fully understand why. It's like he's tugging at a sense of humor that exists on an unearthly level. Cage said that he saw his character as a living cartoon and took inspiration from Woody Woodpecker. Which is perfect because this is the silliest side of the Coens we've ever seen. And one of their best movies. But like all of their movies are one of their best movies. The Coen brothers and Cage had a few clashes on set, with Cage offering up many creative ideas that the brothers simply ignored. Because they're the Coen brothers. Cage quickly learned that the Coen brothers had a vision when shooting and they like to stick to that vision, something that Cage says he respects. You know, because they're the Coen brothers. The film made $30 million off a $2 million budget. So that's a good thing. <coughs> then Cage would star in Moonstruck alongside Cher in her Oscar-winning performance. It's the movie where she slaps him. Cage would receive his first Golden Globe nomination, but at first the studio did not want to cast goofy-looking Nicolas Cage, opting for Peter Gallagher. But Cher threatened to quit if they did not cast Nicholas, because she felt that only he could truly play crazy. And Cher gets what Cher wants. I know. And Cher actually wanted him to be in Moonstruck after watching Peggy Sue Got Married, and she thought that Nicolas Cage's performance was like the worst thing she'd ever seen but for some reason she wanted to work with him. Once again, not understanding why her soul, her creative force was pulling her to this man. I think there's some sort of supernatural thing going on here. The film pulled in over $80 million on a $15 million budget and continues to be hailed as one of the greatest comedies of all time. Nicolas Cage would finish out the decade with something called Time to Kill and the now cult classic Vampire's Kiss. He would again go full method, actually eating a real cockroach and actually being a real vampire. Cage considered this film to be a playground laboratory for his craft, where he could play around and experiment with the art form that us humans like to call acting. But unfortunately, this film failed at the box office. It didn't even make one million dollars. But he did help us learn the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z! Chapter 2, The Decade of Cage. Cage would begin the 1990s starring opposite Laura Dern in David Lynch's Wild at Heart. Cage credits this film with allowing him to break free from his method acting ways. As he said, David Lynch would continuously rewrite the scenes, so he never knew what he was gonna do. There was no real way to prepare. And the nature of these odd characters helped him feel more at ease with the spontaneity on set. David Lynch described Nicolas Cage as the jazz musician of American acting. I think that's 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 perfect. The film won the Palme de Dieu at the Cannes Film Festival, and in a rare occurrence at the festival, the boos from the audience drowned out the cheers. Supposedly Roger Ebert started the booing, because he hated the film, because he didn't get it. But actually I I didn't really like the film the first time I watched it, and then I watched it again and I was like, I get it, I think. I, I, I like it better now. You just, you just gotta be in the right mood to take on a movie with Nicolas Cage and David Lynch together, you know? If you're not in the right mood, it's, it's, it's not gonna work, but if you are, it, 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 it almost works too well. Despite the divisive views of the film, Rolling Stone magazine listed this as number 53 on its greatest movies of the 90s. And those Rolling Stone lists are always right. Right? Nicolas Cage did all of his own singing in Wild at Heart, channeling his future ex-father-in-law, Elvis Presley. Oh, yeah. Cage, Dern, and Lynch would reunite that same year for an experimental concert film called Industrial Symphony No. 1, The Dream of the Broken Hearted. It's about a man who breaks up with a girl over the phone, but in a weird way because it's David Lynch. And after doing that wacky, out-there love story, Wild at Heart, he then did a more traditional romantic comedy, Honeymoon in Vegas. Opposite Sarah Jessica Parker. 
Nicolas Cage would be nominated for a Golden Globe for his performance. And once again, it is very fitting that Nicolas Cage would be in a movie where Elvis Presley features so prominently in the plot. You know, because not long after this, Nicolas Cage would marry Elvis Presley's real daughter, Lisa Marie. One of his five marriages, I think? Shut up! <gasps> Are you trying to give me a heart attack? In 1993, Cage would appear in three commercial flops, Amos and Andrew, starring Samuel L. Jackson, which would fail to even make $10 million at the box office. And he also did a neat movie called Red Rock West. And he was absolutely unforgettable in the ultra-weird crime movie Deadfall, where he has the freakout of all freakouts. <laughs> Nicholas Cage would not exactly light the box office on fire in 1994 either, but he did get the ball rolling in the right direction. In Guarding Tess, Nicholas Cage plays a Secret Service agent who must, uh, you know, guard Tess. He made $27 million at the box office, that's, that's okay, I guess. Next, he would play the leading man in the romantic comedy It Could Happen to You, where Nicolas Cage plays a cop who doesn't have enough cash for a tip, so he promises the waitress that if he wins the lottery, he'll split the winnings with her. And I know that kind of sounds silly, but it's inspired by true events, so it's not silly. The film did pretty well, pulling in $40 million, and critics called it a likable, feel-good romantic comedy. My god, I love those. Then there was a Christmas movie called Trapped in Paradise. It only has a 5% rating on those tomatoes that are rotten.com, but who cares what tomatoes think? Because this is a beloved cult classic, and cults are always right. Co-star John Lovitz said that the director did not direct very much and told the actors to just do whatever they want, which led Nicolas Cage to actually direct a lot of this film. But it only managed to pull in $6 million at the box office, which isn't a lot, but it, it sounds like a lot if you don't have six million dollars. Nicolas Cage started 1995 off with a movie called Kiss of Death starring uh, David Caruso, and Nicolas Cage's performance actually got some really good reviews. They praised his eccentric take on playing this mobster, but the film would only pull in 15 million dollars. <laughs> Of course, it ain't how you start 1995 off, it's how you finish. And Cage finished strong, winning Best Actor at the Academy Awards, that's the one with the Oscars, for his performance as a man who has nothing to live for and decides to drink himself to death in the city of sin. To prepare for the role, Nicolas Cage would record himself while drunk and study how he spoke when inebriated. He also would visit hospitalized alcoholics and even started playing the bongos so that he could develop a musical rhythm to his character. And he even hired a drinking coach who was just a, you know, a real life alcoholic that would just basically hang out with Nicolas Cage and Nicolas Cage would watch him, study him, research. He's sweaty, disgusting, and beautiful in Leaving Las Vegas. It's truly a heartbreaking film, but, you know, it's one of those good heartbreaking films. Roger Ebert ranked this as number seven of the best films of the 90s. Remember the 90s? You can never, never ask me to stop drinking. Do you understand? And now we get into Prime Cage. 1996 would kick off the action star portion of Nicolas Cage's career with the Michael Bay film, The Rock. And this film proves that Michael Bay's mayhem, Bayhem, can at times be high art. Almost. For my money, this is one of the best action movies ever made. The Rock f***ing rocks. They go to Alcatraz and like kick ass. And Nicolas Cage is a nerd who has to become an action hero. Kind of like in real life, he started out nerdy. Then at the end, you believe that he can kick ass? And so this is the perfect movie to transition him into a believable action star. The Rock would be Nicolas Cage's first truly massive hit, pulling in $330 million worldwide on a $75 million budget. He worked alongside the legendary Sean Connery, who only accepted the role because he wanted to work with Nicolas Cage. Can you imagine James Bond wanting to work with you? Nicolas Cage and Sean Connery 
won the coveted Best On-Screen Duo at the MTV Movie Awards. And Cage took on the role because people were telling him that he was too quirky to be an action star. So Cage wanted to prove them wrong. And prove them wrong, he did, over and over and over again. Nicolas Cage grew up as a scrawny little weakling who was often bullied, so in order to escape that reality he would imagine himself as a big tough action hero who wasn't afraid of anything. And it was that childhood fantasy that became the inspiration for how he would play Cameron Poe in the action-packed thrill ride, Con Air. It seemed like this skinny Oscar winner had become a muscle-covered action hero American badass overnight. In fact, the legendary Kid Rock based his classic anthem American Badass on Cage's Cameron Poe character. And there is no greater honor than that. He did his homework for this one working out like crazy, even vacationing in Alabama in order to get the accent just right. This film is the meat and the sandwich that I like to call the Nicolas Cage unholy action movie trinity. Sandwich. Crash landing perfectly right between the rock and face off. The film received high remarks for the cast and the action sequences, yet some found the movie too implausible to forgive. But I forgive its ridiculous plot because that's what makes it so f***ing cool. This was Cage's second massive box office hit in a row, with $220 million on a $75 million budget. Hey, where you going? I'm gonna show you God does exist. Then came his favorite movie, I quote, his favorite movie he's ever made, Face Off. Released only three weeks after Con Air, Cage actually filmed Con Air and Face Off back to back, with the two productions nearly overlapping. For me, this is one of the top five action movies ever made. Ridiculous? Yes, but it's ridiculously awesome. John Woo, Nicolas Cage, Travolta, guns, pigeons, faces coming off? This is great. It really makes you think about what it means to be a person with a face. This was the wrap-up of Nicolas Cage's unholy action trinity, and was another box office behemoth, pulling in over $245 million with an $80 million budget. Critics actually really loved the film, calling it a beautiful, stylized cat-and-mouse game with amazing performances by Cage and Travolta, the top of their game. Nicolas Cage is absolutely bonkers in this one, and Nicolas Cage said his performance was inspired by old German expressionism. But I mean, who isn't inspired by old German expressionism, am I right? <laughs> The year 1998 would see Nicolas Cage win not one, but two Blockbuster Entertainment Awards. One of the most prestigious awards out there. First up was his win for Favorite Actor Drama for the heavenly movie City of Angels. Followed by Favorite Actor Suspense for Brian De Palma's Snake Eyes. In City of Angels, he plays an angel, and as we all know, angels don't blink. So Nicolas Cage trained his eyeballs not to blink. This movie pulled in a healthy $180 million against Snake Eyes' disappointing $103 million because it had a $73 million budget, so didn't make that much. Speaking of Snake Eyes, Nicolas Cage has his own snakes, I mean, they have eyes, they're cobras actually, and he gets in their cage and he drinks wine with them and they speak to him. And this is what they say. He's doing this dance and every now and I'll just turn around and go, you And between making the three or four movies that we had just been talking about, Nicolas Cage was also hard at work at becoming Superman in Tim Burton's Superman Lives, one of the most famous unmade movies ever not made. That's right, Nicolas Cage was so close to being Superman they even put him in a suit. But as we know, that Superman thing didn't really happen. Yet. And it does suck that he missed out on that role that could have been amazing. It actually, it could have been horrible too. But he's missed out on many iconic roles actually. Stuff that could have made him even bigger than he is, if you can even imagine. That's right, Nicolas Cage almost played Constantine and the Green Goblin. He was almost in Lord of the Rings and he was so close to being Neo in the Matrix. And let's not forget that he was almost the wrestler. 
He even trained for it and everything, but he knew it was right to step down and let Mickey Rourke take over. And you know what? He didn't need any of those legendary iconic roles. Nicolas Cage has his own. Nicolas Cage is his own legendary iconic role. Plenty of great characters in his filmography. No regrets. Then came the film 8mm, which was supposed to be a small, low-budget film, and then Nicolas Cage got on board and they gave it more money. But the film would get slaughtered by the critics because they found the sadistic violence unsettling. Yet the audience would show up for this snuff film, making over a hundred million dollars. Then he got to work with Martin Scorsese in Bringing Out the Dead, 1999. One of the greatest years for movies ever. This got generally favorable reviews, yet was a box office bomb. Nicolas Cage would dive deep with his research on this one, so hard that he would actually do ride-alongs in ambulances. And he even had to help a young man who was shot in the ass. And the dude recognized Nicolas Cage. Can you imagine getting shot in the ass? And then Nicolas Cage is in the ambulance helping you? The set of Bringing Out the Dead was so intense that Nick would sweat through 10 shirts a day. Like I always say, you ain't acting if you ain't sweating. Ah! 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 Take it easy. Take it. What happened? He flipped ah! out. Chapter 3 The Facts of Cage. In the first decade of our new millennium, Cage would continue to work and make great films both commercially successful and critically successful, yet the cracks were beginning to form. He was in that Gone in 60 Seconds remake. Critics didn't care for this one, calling the car chases boring, but audiences seemed to disagree because this movie pulled in a healthy $237 million. And Nicolas Cage did all of his own stunt driving and kept one of the cars. That same year, the year 2000, he became a family man in the movie The Family Man. Cage would once again get a Blockbuster Entertainment Award. Favorite actor, comedy. Critics applauded the acting by Cage, but they found the story a little too over-sentimental. But f them, what do they know? Audiences, however, dug it, and it would gross 124 million buckaroos. Then came the year 2001, where Nicolas Cage would star opposite Penelope Cruz in the period drama Captain Corelli's Mandolin, which was getting a lot of Oscar buzz until people watched it. 2002 turned out to be a pretty big year for Cage. He would start the year off by reuniting with his face-off director John Woo for the film Wind Talkers, about the Navajo Code Talkers in World War II. The film would be praised for its expertly crafted action sequences, but critics found the story too full of war cliches. <laughs> Next up was Nicolas Cage's directorial debut, Sonny, starring James Franco, who plays a prostitute in New Orleans. Cage said he read the script 15 years ago and considered it as a starring role for himself, but the project never materialized and no director would commit and Nicolas Cage got too old. So Nicolas Cage decided to direct it himself, because sometimes that's the only way to get your movie made. But the film was a disaster, many blaming it on the misdirection of Nicolas Cage's direction. And perhaps this harsh criticism got to Nicolas Cage because he never sat in the director's chair again. I think you should give it another chance, Nicolas. From Nicolas Cage, in his directorial debut. The baby Sonic. He was getting rave reviews and an Oscar nomination for his performance as Charlie Kaufman and Donald Kaufman, the fictional twin, in the surreal Spike Jones directed adaptation, or as some people call, adaption. So if you don't already know, let me explain this crazy movie. The film was written by Charlie Kaufman about Charlie Kaufman, writing a film about himself writing a film, but it's so much more than just that. Nicolas Cage plays twins who are polar opposites, but Nicolas Cage doesn't remember playing the wacky, fun-loving Donald Kaufman because he was so deep into the mind of the neurotic Charlie Kaufman. He actually recorded tapes of the real Charlie Kaufman and studied all of his emotions, but Nicolas Cage would burn all of those tapes, so you're not gonna find any of that on the DVD bonus feature stuff. The film cost $19 million to make and uh, made $32 million worldwide, so that's okay. And Nicolas Cage calls adaptation the most challenging thing he's ever done. 
2003 saw Nicolas Cage star in Ridley Scott's Matchstick Men. Critics found the film to be a pleasant affair, noting the chemistry between the main cast, however that did not translate to box office buckaroos, as the film only managed to make $65 million off a $62 million budget. I actually just recently watched this one, uh, you know, for uh, research. I was like, wow, this is a really good movie, and then the ending, oh my gosh, it, it, it's a great twist at the end. Uh, watch it. Ridley's Riddle Fooled Me. Cage would return to the world of Jerry Brockheimer with National Treasure about a treasure map on the back of the Declaration of Independence, which is 100% true and the government knows it. The movie was a massive success, pulling in $350 million. He's like the new Indiana Jones, but only for American history. I'm gonna steal the Declaration of Independence. 2005, we would see Nicolas Cage star in two films that I genuinely enjoyed. He was in Lord of War. Cage would play an illegal arms dealer, and rumor has it that real-life arms dealers actually helped fund this film? I don't know about that one. It must be true, because I saw it on the internet. Critics generally enjoyed the movie, calling it intelligent, but ultimately found the plot a bit too, uh, all over the place. But that's okay, I like when things are all over the place sometimes. And this movie has since, in later years, become much more appreciated, many listing it as one of his best films. Next up was the vastly underrated The Weatherman, a dark comedy about a weatherman who is slowly losing grip on his life. This is one of those good movies that's like a slow build character study, and Nicolas Cage really commits to this man's descent, which Cage said that he based on his own life and he even saw the milkshakes being thrown at him as a metaphor for all the bad reviews he got from those nasty critics who don't know what they're talking about. Uh, fuck! Cage would next appear alongside Michael Pena in Oliver Stone's World Trade Center. And remember, this was 2006, so this was one of the very first films to tackle the terrorist attacks of 2001. It had only been a few years and many people were very concerned what Oliver Stone was gonna do with this one because Oliver Stone. But actually, this is a very straightforward tale of tragedy and heroism. Nicolas Cage and Michael Pena play first responders who become trapped under the rubble on that fateful day. And in order to truly understand the claustrophobia of the real life man who went through this, Nicolas Cage would spend hours in a sensory deprivation tank but yeah, many see this movie as a fitting tribute to the heroes of that day. Then there was The Wicker Man. And here we are, the movie that began the descent of Nicolas Cage. Sure, he had a few hits after this movie, but when you really look through his filmography, this is the film that you can stick a pin in and say, yeah, that's when things started to really change. This film has gone down as one of the most unintentionally funny movies ever made, which Nicolas Cage objects to because he said that it was supposed to be a dark comedy. That's the same thing Tommy Wiseau said about The Room, so I don't know. The Wicker Man received an F cinema score, and it only managed to pull in $38 million on a $40 million budget, which I'm surprised it even made that much. And of course, those Razzies came flying in, Nicolas Cage was nominated for Worst Actor and Worst On-Screen Couple for him and his bear suit. Out of my eyes! My eyes! Ah! Ah! It is no secret that Nicolas Cage is an avid comic book fan. His stage name, Cage, came from Luke Cage, and his son is even named Kal-El, which is Superman's Kryptonian name. However, Ghost Rider marks Nicolas Cage's first successful attempt at the superhero movie. Johnny Blaze was a role that he lobbied for quite hard, like he was born for it. And yes, this was 2007, so Nicolas Cage is one of those lucky actors that got to be in a Marvel movie before, you know, before Marvel movies, you know? And Nicolas Cage actually has a Ghost Rider tattoo, which funny enough he had to cover up to play Ghost Rider, and that's his real skull, they digitally scanned it, so yeah, if you ever wondered what Nicolas Cage's skull looks like, there it is. But the film did not light those critics on fire, in a good way. However, that did not stop the global audiences from making this film a hit, making 230 million buckaroos. <laughs> 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 
And even though this is just a big, dumb comic book movie, Nick still went full method. He applied Afro-Caribbean paint on himself and uh, channeled demons and spirits to help him get into character, while he carried priceless ancient Egyptian artifacts around. You know, uh, acting. Nicolas Cage actually says that the inspiration, the true inspiration for his acting style comes from the ancient shaman. You see, the old medicine men of the, the old days, they were the actors of their time. And they would pass down stories and history by performing and playing the characters. So Nicolas Cage continues that tradition as he is our modern day shaman, sharing his legends and stories with us. Also in the year 2007, Nicolas Cage would have a minor role as Fu Manchu in the Rob Zombie directed fake trailer, Werewolf Women of the SS. He was a uh, part of that Grindhouse movie thing. And next was Next. Based on a Philip K. Dick story, because all the best sci-fi movies are, the film follows Nicolas Cage, who is a Las Vegas magician who can see two minutes into the future. Critics felt that this pretty pretentious premise had a powerful promise, but its production's numerous petty plot holes kept it from reaching its full potential, probably. The film made $77 million, but had a $78 million budget. And once again, Nicolas Cage was also nominated for Worst Actor in this movie, next. Also for Ghost Rider and National Treasure Book of Secrets. Speaking of National Treasure 2 Book of Secrets, let's talk about National Treasure 2 Book of Secrets. Cage would return to the world of treasure hunting for this very successful sequel. As far as live action movies go, this is Nicolas Cage's highest grossing film with an impressive $459 million worldwide. Critics didn't really like this Disney adventure through history, but audiences did. 2008 only saw one Nicolas Cage movie. It was an action movie remake called Bangkok Dangerous, and the movie was a bomb and critics and audiences hated it. 2009 would see Cage hit theaters four times. First was the movie Knowing, which is a film that is vastly underrated. Roger Ebert actually calls it one of the best sci-fi movies in, in recent times. And the film did healthy at the box office, pulling in $180 million off a $50 million budget. So that's good, yeah, knowing, it, it's good, watch it. I know. Next up, Cage could be heard but not seen as Speckles, the star-nosed mole in Jerry Brockheimer's G-Force, which did quite well at the box office, making like $300 million. And he did a voice in Astro Boy, which did so poorly that the studio had to shut down. Well, what are you doing? You may not be Toby, but you're still my son. Dad! Then there was a cinematic pairing that I never thought would ever happen, but it, it did. Nicolas Cage and Werner Herzog. Together they joined forces and made Bad Lieutenant, Port of Call, New Orleans. Which has nothing to do, I repeat, has nothing to do with the Harvey Keitel movie. This film is a satire of the modern day cop drama, plus it has iguanas and Val Kilmer. But yeah, this movie is, it's, it's freaking crazy. Critics enjoyed the film and found Nicolas Cage's unhinged performance to be a true standout, truly becoming the California Klaus Kinski. Roger Ebert named this as one of the best films of the decade. But even with all that praise, the film barely made $10 million. It is such a wild ride to watch Werner Herzog direct Nicolas Cage as a crooked cop chilling with gangsters while they're snorting up all the coke and smoking all the crack in New Orleans. Shoot him again. What? Fool. His soul's still dancing. Chapter 4, The Rise of DTV Cage. A once great leading man is forced to reconsider his choices. What seemed like the death of Cage's leading man career was only really the birth of a new stage. He somehow made starring in horrible DTV movies an art form. And not coincidentally, this was around the same time as Nicolas Cage's IRS problems. His out of control spending habits had become public and he was desperate for any role that provided a paycheck. 
Cage was once the highest paid actor in Hollywood, ranking in over $40 million in 2009 alone. However, when you have that much money, you tend to buy stuff. And for Cage, that stuff was... Personal Island? 15 mansions? Two castles? One he bought while searching for the Holy Grail? And the famous mansion of a New Orleans serial killer, which is rumored to be the most haunted house in America. He also had 22 really expensive cars, and a real-life dinosaur skull. The IRS came down hard on Cage for failing to pay several years worth of taxes. So Cage had to sell off all of his bizarre assets, including his copy of Action Comics 1, and it's still unclear if Nicolas Cage is done paying off his debt, although his current workload would suggest that he is. You're gonna be fine, baby doll. Then he kicked ass in the movie Kick-Ass, Cage would start off the decade, 2010, by taking on the supporting role of Big Daddy in Matthew Vaughn's amazing, violent, awesome superhero flick. He basically plays a Batman-like character, and he based the way he speaks off of Adam West. It's perfect. At first, you're like, what is he doing? And then when you get it, you're like, oh my god, it's great. The film would garner solid reviews with critics appreciating the over-the-top violence and the profanity, although uh, there were many advocacy groups that had issues with all the bad, filthy stuff in the movie. So don't watch it. The film, budgeted at $3 million, pulled in a respectable $96 million. Next up, Nicolas Cage would again collaborate with super producer Jerry Brockheimer for the big screen adaptation of Fantasia. Kind of, but not really. It was pitched by Nicolas Cage himself because he wanted to play a character with magical powers. So he was like, hey Disney, make me Fantasia. The film was a flop in the States, pulling in $63 million, but international audiences... They went to go see it and made $150 million there. However, those combined grosses were not enough to overcome the massive production budget and the marketing costs. Then came the year 2011, and that was a death blow to Nicolas Cage's leading man theatrical career. And as you know, he had been on a steady decline, doing okay in supporting roles but not really commanding the screen like he did in years past, with movies like Season of the Witch and Drive Angry 3D. They failed to do anything at the box office and didn't make any impact on our pop culture whatsoever. Then Nicolas Cage began appearing in films that had very limited theatrical releases, or skipped theaters altogether. For most performers, that shift can signal that a person has given up, destined to turn in mediocre performances just so they can clear the checks. But Nicolas Cage is not most performers. I don't think Nicolas Cage knows how to turn it off. Like I said, Nicolas Cage cannot be caged. Open it! Cage would star opposite Nicole Kidman in the final film directed by Joel Schumacher, Trespass. And just before filming began, Cage left the project because he wanted to play the villain in the film instead of the, the husband. So Joel Schumacher was scrambling to find an actor to replace him. But Cage would change his mind the next day and continue playing the husband. Oh, Nicholas. Up next was Seeking Justice, a film that opened at number 27 at the box office. So you had Drive Angry 3D, Season of the Witch, and Trespass. They all got him Razzie nominations for Worst Actor and Worst Screen Couple for Nicolas Cage and anyone who shared a screen with him. Then came that post-apocalyptic year of 2012. Cage would star in a mostly unasked for sequel, to Ghost Rider called Spirit of Vengeance, which was originally intended to have a dark R-rated flavor because that's what the fans want. However, Sony decided against that, essentially killing the franchise, with Cage refusing to return for a third movie. But now the film rights for that character have gone back to Marvel Studios, so yay! Then Cage would reunite with his Con Air director, Simon West, for a film called Stolen. It made like $300,000. But 2013 was actually a okay year for him. He would do a caveman voice in a movie that was the best box office performance of his entire career, The Crudes. It made $587 million. Cage would then team up with John Cusack in The Frozen Ground. Critics actually really enjoyed this thriller. So he was on a roll. It was like, hey, Nicolas Cage, he's kind of back. Yeah. 
And then he would team up with director David Gordon Green for the amazing film called Joe, where critics gave high praise to Nicolas Cage's performance. It was so powerful, so quiet, so strong. And Cage said that his performance actually required very little acting because Joe is very close to who he really is. And so yeah, Nicolas Cage is he's so surprising. Just when you lose all hope for him, he, he goes and turns out a film like Joe. It's a beautiful flick. If I find out something's happening to that boy, I'm gonna whip whoever's ass has something to do with it. Now get the hell away from me before I knock what's left of your fucking teeth out. But Nicolas Cage would kick off 2014 with the direct video Rage, followed by Outcast, and the Christian apocalypse thriller Left Behind, not the one with Kirk Cameron. After that, Cage would appear in the film Dying by the Light, but unfortunately the director and the cast felt that the studio hijacked and ruined the movie. So these actors would wear t-shirts with their non-disparagement clause printed on it as a form of silent protest. I am going to do something worth remembering. Then he did some more direct-to-video movies. Movies like The Runner, Pay the Ghost, The Trust, Dog Eat Dog, and a very small role in Snowden as a favor to Oliver Stone. Then there was USS Indianapolis Men of Courage, a true story that you probably heard about on Shark Week, or Quint's monologue from Jaws. Then there was Army of One from the director of Borat, based on a true story about a man who heard the voice of God tell him to go kill Osama bin Laden with a samurai sword, and Nick got so into character that he claims he actually started talking to God. That's crazy. No, I have a lot to do. I'm planning and training. <laughs> then there was a movie Arsenal, where he brings back his iconic Deadfall character. They just let Nicolas Cage just be Nicolas Cage in that one. Then there was Vengeance, a love story, and Inconceivable. And there was also a kind of decent horror movie called Mom and Dad. Nicolas Cage calls this his favorite film he's done in 10 years. And then 2018 was a pretty big year for Cage. He had seven films. Let's talk about all seven. Oh my god. There was Mandy. This story of motorcycle riding demons has been hailed as one of the best B movies made in recent years, with unanimous praise for Nicolas Cage's out of this world f***ing crazy performance. He's insane in this one. This movie is is beyond crazy. There's like space cocaine and and chainsaw fights and lots and lots of Nicolas Cage screaming and his pain it just jumps right off the screen and you 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 feel it and it buries itself deep inside of your soul. Nicolas Cage said that he channeled the pain in his real life to bring this performance out. And Mandy received a five minute standing ovation at the Cannes Film Festival. <laughs> but then he was right back to DTV with movies like Looking Glass, The Humanity Bureau, 211, and Between Worlds. Oh my goodness, no, that, that sounds terrible. But also, Cage would voice two iconic superheroes on the big screen in Teen Titans Go to the movies. He would finally, 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 finally get to play the role that he was meant to play. Superman! That's right, Nicolas Cage finally is Superman in this Teen Titans movie. It's silly. And he would earn great praise for the Academy Award winning film Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, where he played one of the Spider-Men. He also did a movie called A Score to Settle, and uh, Running with the Devil, Kill Chain, Grand Isle, which I hear is just unwatchable, and a movie called Primal, which I actually watched because I thought it was going to be like snakes on a plane, but jaguars on a boat, but, but no, it, it, it wasn't good. I mean, Nicolas Cage is good in it because he's Nicolas Cage, but, ugh. <laughs> Nicolas Cage can release five films that are universally hated in a single year, then make everyone forget all of those stinkers, 
with an occasional batshit crazy masterpiece, I use that word lightly, but you know, color out of space. This movie was based on an HP Lovecraft story, and like Mandy, it is, you know, the perfect vehicle for Nicolas Cage to just be Nicolas Cage and, and just let his creative juices flow. The director asked Nicolas Cage to model his color out of space performance off of his own performance in Vampire's Kiss, so this is Nicolas Cage channeling Nicolas Cage, critics hailed this film as a welcome return for director Richard Stanley, while calling the film a very impressive B-movie, and they loved the gonzo performance by Nicolas Cage. <laughs> then there was the year 2020. Y'all remember 2020? First out was the DTV action sci-fi thing called Jiu-Jitsu. I think it's on Netflix now, if you have that. Can I have your password? Then there would be the successful sequel to The, the Croods, called The Croods, A New Age. It was released for Thanksgiving weekend, and the film spent three weeks at the top of the box office. Then came the year 2021, which is the year that we're currently in, and that I'm currently making this. Cage is now a superhuman, larger-than-life celebrity who people want to see him just be himself. You know, it's up there with the likes of uh, Christopher Walken, Bill Murray, Al Pacino, or e even Vincent Price, where they have kind of become parodies of themselves, but without ruining their legacy, actually adding to it in a strange way. He's one of those rare actors who can do that, and I think he's the best at it. In fact, Cage has found a way to use his bizarre persona on and off screen much to his advantage. He's made a career out of being f***ing crazy. And the film Willy's Wonderland is a great example of this. So I'm gonna try pitching the story of this movie in two ways. First, a mute drifter fights Five Night at Freddy's characters for 90 minutes. You're like, oh, okay, I get it. But now I'm gonna pitch it again in a different way. I'm gonna say, Nicolas Cage fights Five Nights at Freddy's characters for 90 minutes. And you're like, oh, okay, I get it you instantly see the entire movie in your head. Which is why I kind of feel like I don't need to watch this one. Nicolas Cage is more than an actor now. Nicolas Cage is a tone. Just adding his name to the poster sets the tone for what you're in for. Which is why so many people love Willy's Wonderland. And why so many people hate it. Because using Nicolas Cage's persona like that, it, there's a fine line you gotta cross. The film can rely too heavily on the Cage element. Just adding the cage ingredient is not enough sometimes. Sometimes you, 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 you need a good story too. You can't just sprinkle Nicolas Cage on your movie and expect it to be good. A lot of the times that works, but Cage is unpredictable. But that also is what makes him so great. So yeah, I don't know. Did you like this movie or did you not? Comment your comment in the comments. And if you have that Netflix thing, you can currently find Nicolas Cage as the host of the hilarious and informative documentary series, The History of Swear Words. You learn what the f the word f means, and when I found out, I was like, what the f But then I, I f***ing forgot. Needless to say, Nicolas Cage is a man who cannot be stopped. Even if all of his films aren't gold mines, every few years he seems to find a project that is perfectly suited to his cageness. And it looks like Nicolas Cage is hard at work bringing us a whole new batch of films. And they seem very intriguing. I cannot wait to see what he has in store for us next. Nicolas Cage is a legend. There was no other way to describe this man. When most movie stars give up on their careers, Nicolas Cage decided to use the freedom that smaller productions provided. He found a place where his insanity can truly shine. And sure, with the law of averages, if you make a ridiculous amount of movies, yeah, some of them are gonna be stinkers. But I think most actors would kill to have what Nicolas Cage has. Every movie he's in gets people talking, and he hits a nerve for how bold he is. And that is probably why Nicolas Cage is the biggest star in the world right now. He is the only actor that seems overrated and underrated at the same time, if that makes sense. 
But nobody can deny that Nicolas Cage never phones it in. No matter how horrible the movie is, he's always trying his best. And sometimes his best hits right on target. But sometimes he misses the mark. And sometimes he destroys the target and devours it. But it's his great sense of humor about his persona that allows this everlasting love to flourish. How is this possible? I'm looking at two identical <laughs> Nick Cages. Well, Seth, I can explain if you just calm down! <laughs> and my favorite thing about Nicolas Cage is how he plans to spend eternity, if he ever dies, that is, because, you know, he's a vampire. But it does seem like the afterlife is on Nicolas Cage's mind. He purchased his own pyramid to be buried in, which currently is in a New Orleans cemetery, and this unoccupied tomb has become a tourist attraction. And this is a nine-foot stone structure pyramid that has led many people to believe that Nicolas Cage is a member of the Illuminati. But I mean, who isn't nowadays, right? And I actually went to New Orleans a few years back, and it seemed like every single taxi driver there had a Nicolas Cage story. And most of the stories involved Nicolas Cage roaming the streets of New Orleans screaming in a drunken rampage, WHERE DO I LIVE? WHERE DO I LIVE? But I'll tell you where you live, Nicolas Cage. Right here. In our hearts. But I guess the real answer to what the f*** happened to Nicolas Cage came from my stepdaughter. One evening, during our family dinner, my wife and I were discussing the works of Nicolas Cage because, you know, that's a topic that comes up when you're married to me. And suddenly my stepdaughter joined in on the conversation. And I was like, whoa, whoa, wait, do you know who Nicolas Cage is? And she simply answered, yeah, he's a meme. Which was the most perfect answer ever. And it is because of that that I believe that Nicolas Cage's legacy is secure. He will continue to be immortal through the power of the meme, whether he's a vampire or not. And that is what the fuck happened to Nicolas Cage. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We're an independent company and we appreciate all your support.